Coming to the histopathology of benign prostatic hypertrophy, now this is classically one of the nodules that we were seeing. It is one nodule. So, this is a nodule that we can see, and this nodule is showing multiple glands. So you can see multiple glands over here. And individual glands, if you see, they are thrown into multiple papillae. So, there is a papillary architecture that we can appreciate. So, individual glands, they are having infoldings. Means, normally they used to be like this. But now, the gland is showing, okay, some foldings like this, okay. So, as a result, okay, you are having multiple papillary architecture over here. As we can appreciate over here. There is multiple papillary infoldings as we can appreciate in the low power view. This is the high power view. See, this is how a normal prostate gland usually looks like. But over here, if you see, this is thrown into multiple papillae. I, I hope you all can appreciate they are thrown into multiple papillae. Okay. So, individual nodules, they contain small to large to cystically dilated glands that are separated by bland spindle shapes. And I told you, in between the glands, you are having your fibromuscular stroma. Fibromuscular stroma, okay. Bland spindle shaped stromal cells can be appreciated, okay. Oh, okay we are going to read about the prostate pathology, wherein we are going to discuss two very important entities. For one, we are going to talk about benign prostatic hypertrophy, and secondly, we are going to talk about prostatic carcinoma, okay. Now, very importantly, along with the prostatic carcinoma, one very important topic that will be discussed is the serum prostate specific antigen and the role of PSA in the screening of prostate cancers. So, without wasting any time, let us begin today's topic of discussion. Now, before we start the pathology of the prostate, we have to understand certain relevant anatomy of the prostate. So, as you can look in this particular diagram, the normal prostate, okay. Now, this is the prostate as we can appreciate over here, the prostate gland as we can. Okay, the so, prostate is basically a retroperitoneal organ which is encircling the neck of the bladder. Okay, so this is the neck of the bladder which is encircled by the prostate as well as it is encircling the urethra as we can appreciate over here. So, in normal adults, the prostate they are weighing approximately 20 grams. Okay, approximately 20 grams. Now, if you see that the normal prostate they contain several distinct regions. Okay, so there are several divisions if you can appreciate. So, this at the center as you can see, this is the prostatic urethra. And the prostate can be divided into different regions. For example, this region number A, this is the central zone. This is the central zone. Okay. Then the region number D, okay, this is the peripheral zone. Okay. This is the peripheral zone. This is the central zone. Okay. Then the region number C, that is the transitional zone. It is the transitional zone. Okay. And then this region number uh, E that we can appreciate over here, this is the periurethral zone. There is one more zone over here as we can appreciate. This is your fibromuscular zone okay so i would just repeat once again this is your peripheral zone okay then this as you can appreciate this is the central zone okay and this is the transitional zone transitional zone so what is the importance why are we dividing the prostate into different regions okay because these zones, these different zones of the prostate, they are at, at a risk of different proliferative lesion. For example, most of the carcinomas are arising from the peripheral zone. So, it is the peripheral zone which is mostly giving rise to cancers. Okay. And uh, because they are peripheral uh, in location, therefore, the prostate carcinomas can be easily palpable during the digital rectal examination. Now, Second important entity is the benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is a benign condition. It is in contrast, it is most commonly arising from the transitional zone. Okay. The centrally uh, situated transitional zone is giving rise to benign prostatic hyperplasia. And as we can appreciate, this benign prostatic hyperplasia region, this area, this is very much close and surrounding the prostatic urethra. So, it often produces urinary obstruction as its most important clinical feature. Okay. So, again, the prostate is divided into several regions and it is very important to divide them because different kinds of proliferative lesions are arising from these separate regions. So we have the central zone, peripheral zone, transitional zone, periurethral zone and fibromuscular zone. Very importantly, the peripheral zone is giving rise to carcinomas of the prostate whereas the transitional zone, this area, this is basically giving rise to benign prostatic hyperplasia and because that is very much close to the, the urethra, therefore, 
they are uh, you know most commonly they are giving rise to urinary obstruction this is the normal anatomy of the prostate as we can appreciate there are many glands which are present in the prostate so these are the prostatic gland are the prostatic glands as we can appreciate over here now very important in between the glands we are having a stroma okay this is containing both fibrous and muscular tissue so they are called as fibro muscular stroma okay so normally the prostate is comprising of multiple prostatic glands okay which is basically separated by fibro muscular stroma now you can appreciate that within certain glands if you see okay certain glands are showing certain secretions okay you can appreciate the secretions over here also what are these secretions called as they are called as corpora amylacea corpora amylacea now one very important thing that i want you to tell is that now if you look at the normal prostatic glands they do not have any papillary configuration that means normally if you see the the glands do, do not show any formation of papilla they do show but they are occasional papilla means for example from here the glands are thrown into several papillae like this okay so that is not seen in a normal prostate gland okay increased amount of papilla is not seen in a normal prostate gland okay normal prostate gland doesn't show excessive papilla if you look at the high power view what we can appreciate that at the center we are having what is called as corpora amylacea is there at the center as we can appreciate and very importantly why have i shown you this particular image if you concentrate at this point there are two layers okay on the outer aspect okay there is the cuboidal layer of cell okay they are having the cuboidal basal layer okay low cuboidal this is the basal layer of the uh, you know epithelial lining of the glands and on top you can see a layer of columnar cells okay which are secretory in nature which are secretory in nature so there are two layer of cells so why it is very important because in benign or in normal histology you are going to see two layers of cells okay whereas in cancer if you see the basal layer is absent completely so again i am repeating over here that if you appreciate the normal prostate glands they are lined by two layers of cells a basal layer of low cuboidal basal epithelium as we can appreciate over here again i am going to show you over here this is the basal cells over here now, on top of the basal cells you are having this columnar secretory cells and these are the basal cells okay the columnar secretory cells are responsible for secretion of this corpora amylacea and you also have understood that this dual layer of lining is suggestive of a benign nature in cancer this basal cell layer is completely absent okay okay now testicular androgens that is the testosterones dihydrotestosterones they are controlling the main growth and survival of the prostatic cells and castration will lead to widespread apoptosis of the prostatic epithelium leading to atrophy of the prostate so just uh, what we are trying to tell over here is that that the prostatic growth is totally dependent on the testicular hormones that is the testosterones and dihydrotestosterones now multiple pathogenesis can involve the prostate but the three most important ones are prostatic inflammation that is prostatitis benign prostatic hyperplasia or hypertrophy and we are having the tumors that is prostatic carcinoma mainly okay so out of these three conditions today's lecture we will discuss in detail about bph and the prostatic carcinoma now, out of all these lesions you will see that bph is the most common and it often occurs in older males that it can almost be viewed as a normal part of aging process okay so it is most commonly involving older males and it is regarded as a part of the process of aging now prostatic carcinoma is extremely common in older men and it is an important cause of morbidity and mortality okay because clinically these two things are more common so we are going to discuss these two things in today's lecture so the first part of the lecture we are going to discuss about benign prostatic hypertrophy so benign prostatic hypertrophy also referred to as nodular hyperplasia is the most common benign prostatic disease and older than 50 years of age approximately 30% men in this age group they have moderate to severe symptoms of bph that means at the age of 50 years 30% men will have uh, moderate to severe symptoms of bph whereas this incidence will go as high as 90% by the time men are reaching 80% uh, 80 years of age 
So as you increase in age, the incidence of BPH also increases. You have to remember very importantly, it is not a pre-malignant lesion. Now, what is the etiopathogenesis of this lesion? Let us try and understand this with the help of this flow chart. So, normally in our body, testosterone that is released in our body normally, okay, this testosterone is acting on the prostatic stromal cell, okay, and they are also acting on the epithelial cell. In the stromal cells, in the prostatic stromal cells, the testosterone with the help of the enzyme 5-alpha reductase type 2 is converted to dihydrotestosterone that is DHT. And this DHT is capable of acting on the androgen receptor. This androgen receptor, usually they are cytoplasmic in nature. But once DHT is binding with the androgen receptors, they translocate into the nucleus and they stimulate the, the, the process of transcription, translation and growth factors are produced. Okay. So, this is how the growth factors are getting produced. Okay. Similarly, this DHT which is produced in the prostatic stromal cells, they can also diffuse into the epithelial cells and act on the androgen receptors present in the epithelial cells and cause the, you know, and again they will translocate into the nucleus and they will, you know, they are going to transcribe growth factors which is going to cause the growth of both the stromal and the epithelial cells as we can appreciate. So, the growth factors released are responsible for the prostatic growth. Now, remember this 5-alpha reductase type 2, this enzyme is mainly present in the prostatic stromal cells only. They are not, this is not present. This enzyme is not present in the epithelial cell. One, another very important point in the pathogenesis is that, that the type 1, this, uh, this was the type 2 5-alpha reductase. The type 1 5-alpha reductase is present in extra prostatic sites like the liver and the skin. And extra prostatically, this testosterone is converted to dehydrose testosterone and this DHT which is formed outside, they can also enter the prostate and they can, you know, facilitate this same process that we are seeing over here. Okay. So, this is the basic pathogenesis of the BPH. Not only testosterone, there is also the role of estrogens, okay, in the causation of BPH. How? Let us see. So, normally as I told you, the DHT is acting on the stromal cells which is releasing two forms of growth factors, okay. One form of growth factor is mainly the FGF, fibroblast growth factor, keratinocyte growth factor, insulin-like growth factors, epidermal growth factor. So, all these growth factors, they are really causing epithelial cell proliferation. Whereas, the TGF beta, this is another, uh, you know, uh, factor, growth factor that is released. This is mainly controlling the epithelial cell growth by causing epithelial cell death. So, normally both the process, they are balancing each other and normally this is responsible for normal prostate development. Now, what happens that when the estrogen comes, okay, estrogen normally they balance out both the process. Now, estrogen via certain receptors, they can stimulate the formation of this growth factor leading to epithelial cell proliferation. But estrogen via another set of growth factors, they can also stimulate TGF beta and they can, uh, you know, cause epithelial cell death. Normally, this process is uh, classically they are balanced. But in case of older people, okay, what happens that this pathway, this pathway of epithelial cell proliferation is more stimulated by the estrogen and this pathway uh, is more inhibited. Okay, this pathway is more inhibited such that there is net epithelial cell proliferation leading to benign prostatic hyperplasia. So, whatever I have told you right now, I am just going to read it out, the pathogenesis. So, as I told you that dihydrotestosterone, also called as the DHT, it is the main androgen which is present in the prostate where it is formed from the testosterone to the action of the enzyme 5-alpha reductase type 2. This enzyme is expressed primarily in the stromal cells of the prostate and it is not expressed in the prostatic epithelial cells. Very important point to note. Okay. Now, type 1 5 alpha reductase is also there. So, like there is type 2 5 alpha reductase present in the prostatic stromal epithelial cell, there is type 1 5 alpha reductase which is present outside the, the prostate. So, this is another enzyme that is mediating uh, the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. Okay, and this conversion is taking place in extra prostatic locations like the liver and the skin. And this provides an additional source of DHT that reaches the prostate through the blood. Now, DHT is going to bind to and activate the androgen receptors. Okay, so DHT formed anywhere which are, so DHT which is formed in the stromal cell can go into the epithelial cell. DHT from the liver and skin that is formed, they can also enter the prostate and they can go to the stromal and the epithelial cell. So, DHT from anywhere it will go and it will bind and activate the androgen receptors which are found in both the stromal and the epithelial prostate cells. 
Now it is more potent. DHT is more potent as compared to testosterone because it has a higher affinity for androgen receptors and forms a more stable complex with the androgen receptors. That is why DHT becomes more important for prostate development as compared to your testosterone. Now, as the DHT binds to the androgen receptors, they will translocate the receptors from the cytoplasm to the nucleus and this is going to trigger transcription of androgen dependent genes releasing several growth factors and receptors. So, the most uh, important growth factors among them are the FGF family that is we have read the IGF, AGF, EGF. So, epidermal growth factors, keratinocyte growth factors, insulin like growth factors, all of them are in the FGF family and they are released. Okay. This group basically causes epithelial cell proliferation whereas another uh, transforming growth factor beta which is released it usually inhibits the growth. Now fibroblast growth factor as I told you produced by the stromal cells they are, they are regulators of androgen stimulated epithelial growth during the prostate development in the embryon. So it is important for embryonic prostatic development and it is believed that some of these pathways they become reawakened in adulthood to produce prostatic growth in BP. Okay. A TGF beta serves as a mitogen for fibroblast and other mesenchymal cell, but it inhibits epithelial proliferation. Normally, the FGF family they are going to stimulate a proliferation, and the TGF family is going to inhibit. Normally, there is a balance between the two. Okay, so although the ultimate cause of BPH is unknown, it is believed that DHT uh, induced growth factors they act by increasing the proliferation of the stromal cells and by decreasing the death of the epithelial cells. So this is a basic mechanism of uh, you know hypertrophy of the prostate. Now this is the role of DHT or the role of testosterone in the causation of your BPH. Now what is the role of estrogen as I told you estrogen also has a very important role as I told you the estrogen is acting via two forms of estrogen receptor ER alpha and ER beta. Now estrogen when they are acting via the ER alpha they are having proliferative effect Whereas when they are acting via ER beta, they are having anti-proliferative effect on the prostate cells. So normally, uh, uh, estrogen is acting equally on both these receptors, so as to you know have a net, you know, normal balance. A net balance is there between proliferative and anti-proliferative activity. In BPH pathogenesis, estrogen is acting more via ER alpha as compared to ER beta. So there is net proliferative effect as compared to anti-proliferative effect. So the balance is shifted towards proliferation by estrogen. Okay, so this is the basic pathogenesis of benign prostatic hyperplasia. Okay. We have already seen these charts. Okay. Now we are going to discuss about the morphology of BPH. Now in BPH, the weight of the enlarged prostate often increases three to five fold the normal value, and the even and even greater enlargement can be seen as compared to cis. Normally we have seen the weight was twenty gram. So over here the weight has increased to three to five fold, three to five times it has multiplied. And BPH, because they are affecting the transition zone, so it may encroach on the urethra, compressing it to a slit-like orifice. I will show you with the help of a diagram. Now, microscopically, if you see that uh, you are going to see that if you see a particular histopathological slide, you are going to see multiple variable sized nodules. Okay. And each of these nodules, if you see, each of these nodules, they are having many glands. Okay, they have dilated glands. Okay. And this dilated gland, they are separated by a fibromuscular stromal material. So, individual nodules, they contain small to large to cystically dilated glands that are separated by bland spindle shaped stromal cells. Okay. Now, the glands, they are lined. Now, this glandular epithelium, if you see, they are lined by two layers of cells. The same thing that we had seen in a normal prostate. So, on the, uh, you know, on the outer aspect, you will have a low columnar, a low cuboidal epithelium on the outer aspect of the gland. And if you see on the inner aspect, you will have columnar secretory cells like this. This is how a gland is, okay. So, on the outer aspect of the gland, you will have a basal layer of low cuboidal cell. Whereas, on the inner aspect, you will have columnar cell, okay. Columnar cell which are secretory in nature. They are responsible for secretion of corpora amylacea. So, this is one of your gland, okay, which is present inside a nodule. This is one nodule, okay. This is one gland as we can appreciate over here. So, the glands, they are lined by two layer of cell, an inner columnar secretory layer and an outer cuboidal or flattened basal epithelium. And most importantly, what is it that differentiates a BPH uh, uh, from uh, a normal prostate gland? That these glands, if you see, these glands, if you see, on the inner aspect, they are forming multiple papillae, okay. They are forming multiple infolding 
producing a papillary architecture i will show you with the help of diagram don't worry in markedly enlarged glands there is compromise of vascular supply it may produce prostatic infarcts which may have adjacent areas of squamous metaplasia as well so this is the cross gross image of the prostate as we can appreciate so on grossly you can see multiple nodules that we can appreciate grossly over here the gross image of the prostate which is showing multiple nodules over here now some of the nodules if you see they are quite pinkish and yellowish in nature and some of the nodules they are whitish in nature this is whitish nodule this is pale this is yellow pinkish nodule so on cross section if you see hyperplastic nodules are seen to vary in the color and consistency depending on the cell content now nodules that contain mostly glands they are yellowish pink in color so you can see this yellowish pink this yellowish pink this yellowish pink nodule you can see so those nodules which are looking like yellowish pink they are rich in glands and they are soft and they exude milky white prostatic fluid but the nodules if you see certain nodules this nodule if you see is completely white okay they are completely white they are pale gray and firm so nodules which are quite pale gray and they are firm in nature okay they are basically forming fibromuscular stroma okay they are primarily composed of fibromuscular stroma now well defined nodules of bph will compress the urethra into a slit like lumen you can see multiple nodules over here they have actually made the lumen slit like this is the prostatic urethra has become slit like coming to the histopathology of benign prostatic hypertrophy now this is classically one of the nodule that we were seeing this is one nodule so this is a nodule that we can see and this nodule is showing multiple glands you can see multiple glands over here and individual glands if you see they are thrown into multiple papillary so there is a papillary architecture that we can appreciate so individual glands they are having infoldings means normally they used to be like this but now the gland is showing okay some foldings like this okay so as a result okay you are having multiple papillary architecture over here as we can appreciate over here there is multiple papillary infoldings as we can appreciate in the low power view this is a high power view see this is how a normal prostate gland usually looks like but over here if you see this is thrown into multiple papillary I, I hope you all can appreciate they are thrown into multiple papillary okay so individual nodules they contain small to large to cystically dilated glands that are separated by bland spindle shapes and i told you in between the glands you are having your fibro muscular stroma fibro muscular stroma okay bland spindle shaped stromal cells can be appreciated okay so as we can appreciate in this diagram now on the left hand side again what we can appreciate over here is that the two layer of cell is yet retained that means this is a benign condition you can see one layer of low cuboidal cell is there it is continuing okay the low cuboidal cell and one columnar layer cell is also there so the classical two layer is retained so the glands are showing see this is one layer over here and this is another layer of columnar cell so the glands are lined by the two layer of cells an inner columnar so this is the inner columnar secretory cell layer and an outer cuboidal or flattened basal epithelium and infolding of the glands can be seen that is giving rise to a papillary architecture so this gland normally the gland are like this and the lining is somewhat like this okay over here the lining in fact is thrown into multiple fold this is the papillary architecture that i am talking about over here okay so it is giving a papillary architecture they produce a papillary architecture on the right hand side what you can appreciate over here is certain secretions which is the corpora amylase secretion and appreciate in this diagram let us look at the clinical features of bph now as i told you because bph they are involving the transitional zone which is very close to the urethra so the main symptoms of bph arise because of urinary obstruction caused by prostatic enlargement and stromal smooth muscle mediated contraction now the increased resistance to urinary outflow will lead to bladder hypertrophy as well as distension accompanied by urine retention now the inability to empty the bladder completely will create a reservoir of residual urine which is a common source of infection the patients experience increased urinary frequency nocturia difficulty in starting and stopping the stream of urine overflow dribbling and dysuria that is painful micturition 
and because the urine is not completely voided and some amount of residual urine is there so they have a very increased risk of developing bacterial infection not only of the bladder but also of the kidney in many cases sudden acute urinary retention uh, might require emergency catheterization for relief so because the basic problem in case of bph is because of dht that is there and this dht is mainly produced by 5 alpha reductase enzyme okay and this dht is mainly acting via the androgen receptor so how are you going to treat so you can either block this particular enzyme with the help of 5 alpha reductase inhibitors in this case dht will not be produced or for example in case that dht is produced you can give androgen receptor antagonist or this is androgen receptor basically is a, is a alpha receptor so you can give androgen receptor blockers so alpha adrenergic blockers can be used okay so as to counteract their effect now the former the former means five uh, the former means alpha adrenergic blockers they act via inhibition of alpha 1 adrenergic receptors while the latter that is the five alpha reductase inhibitors are acting by shrinking the prostate size by decreasing the synthesis of dht now for moderate to severe cases a wide range of invasive procedures exist now TURP that is transurethral resection of the prostate was for very long considered the gold standard method but now alternative procedures to destroy excessive prostatic tissue have been developed with lower morbidity and lower cost so these procedures include high intensity focused ultrasound laser therapy hyperthermia transurethral electrovaporization and radio frequency ablation so with this we have completed in details the bph and now we are going to start with the prostate carcinoma.